from Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock. Junior doctors in England have announced another strike as part of their pay dispute with the government. The British Medical Association says they'll stage a 72-hour walkout from the 14th of June, saying it's in response to a 5% offer on wages. That compares with a pay offer of 14.5% for junior doctors in Scotland. LBC's Scotland editor, Gina Davidson, says that could solve the dispute there. This offer is the result of pretty intense negotiations over the last four weeks between the Scottish Government and BME Scotland. The First Minister, Hamza Youssef, even getting involved at quite an early stage, something that normally comes towards the end of these negotiations when things seem uh, pretty intractable. Sir Keir Starmer has outlined Labour's promises to improve the NHS in England if it forms the next UK government. The party leader says he doesn't think the health service will survive under the Tories for another five years, although ministers are insisting they are reducing waiting lists. The Home Secretary insists she did not try to evade sanction over a speeding ticket last year. Suella Braverman is accused of asking her team to help arrange a private speed awareness course for her. The Prime Minister has spoken to her about the handling of the offence. It's understood police investigating the disappearance of Madeleine McCann will begin new searches of a reservoir tomorrow. The stretch of water is about 30 miles from where the three-year-old went missing in Portugal in 2007 and is said to have been visited by the main suspect, Christian B. German authorities apparently requested the search. Jim Gamble, who founded a major online child protection initiative, says it's an interesting development. The German police are generally cautious by nature, but they've been absolutely adamant that they have the right person in custody and that they know what happened to Madeleine. So that makes me hopeful. And emergency services in West Yorkshire are dealing with a large moorland fire on the Pennines this evening. The county's fire service says one square kilometre is alight at Marsden Moor near Huddersfield. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed up 14 points at 77.70. The pound buys $1.24 and €1.14. LBC weather dry tonight with largely clear spells for England and Wales. Cloudier though in Scotland and Northern Ireland with lows of four. Dry tomorrow for much of the UK with sunshine and patchy cloud. A few spots of rain for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but highs of 22 degrees. From Global's Newsroom for LBC, I'm Tim Daly. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. This is Cross Question. 8.02 is the time. Ben Kentish here on LBC in for Ian Dale tonight. And joining me for Cross Question in the studio tonight are Baroness Shari Chakrabarti, Labour peer, former Shadow Attorney General and a former Director of the Human Rights Campaign at Liberty. Daniel Korski is with us, a former Deputy Head of Policy for David Cameron while he was Prime Minister, now running to be the Conservative candidate for Mayor of London. Uh, Lord Willits is here, Lord David Willits, a Conservative peer, former Universities Minister and President of the Anti-Poverty Think Tank, the Resolution Foundation and Jane Ozan is with us, former government advisor on LGBT issues, chair of the Ban Conversion Therapy Coalition and herself an evangelical Christian. If you've got a question, if you've got a thought, if you've something you want to put to our panellists, 0345 973 is the number you need. You can text us on 84850 or tweet at LBC. Maybe you want to ask about Suella Bravman saying Labour is just using the allegations about her speeding ticket to distract from their opposition to the government's anti-crime measures. Maybe you've got a question about Keir Starmer's NHS speech, promising to fix the health service but not necessarily give it any more money. Maybe you'd like to ask about the government uh, expecting to ban most international students from bringing family members to the UK. Or perhaps it's the fact that 1.7 million children regularly fail to attend school in England that's on your mind tonight. 0345 606 973 the number to call. And don't forget, you can, of course, watch Cross Question live on Global Player. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross Question. Watch on Global Player. This is LBC. Lots of questions coming in already. James in Chelsea is going to kick us off tonight. Good evening, James. Yeah, good evening, Ben. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, evening, panel. Um, just a very short, evening. quick uh, question. Um, how, the, how can the Conservative Party call themselves the party of law and order with everything that's gone on in the last couple of months? 
What are you talking about specifically, James? Um, I'm talking about Dominic Robb, Nadim Tahawi. Now we've got Bravar Braverman in the spotlight again over conduct. And they call themselves the party of law and order. We've got a second prime minister who's been fined, or well, has been found to have broken the law by not wearing his seatbelt. So we've got the second prime minister okay. in office who's, who's broken the law. So, yes. Got it. Let's see what the panel thinks, James. Thank you for that question. Daniel Korski. Well, look, I mean, um, it's not a pretty sight, isn't it? You know, you, you expect politicians of all stripes, including those in government, to behave in a respectable manner, and it's just not a pretty sight. We don't know exactly the details of what's uh, been going on with Suela Braverman, and I gather the Prime Minister is consulting his ethics advisor, so I think we should just uh, hold breath on that. But uh, but it's not a great sight, that's, that's true. I think we should all expect more from our politics, whether on the left or on the right. Um, and, and certainly our, your, our caller is right to, to ask for that, you know. We need politicians, um, not necessarily to be road models, but certainly to show uh, the kind of respect that people on the streets of London uh, have to show every day to each other. Sue and Abraman again in the news for the wrong reasons this week. Daniel, is she becoming a problem for your party? Is she becoming a problem for Rishi Sunak and the government? Look, I don't think um, she's a problem. I think that she represents sort of a particular wing of the Conservative Party. It's not going to be a surprise to anybody that that's not the wing that I sit on. You know, I represent a different kind of Conservative politics. Um, but it's true that she does represent that wing, um, you know, a wing that's concerned about the levels of migration and particularly illegal migration. Uh, and I think it's naive to think that if Suella Braverman, you know, exits stage left, uh, somehow um, she'll be replaced by a sort of liberal dream uh, of Home Secretary. Uh, the truth is, uh, there's a lot of concern in this country about illegal immigration and levels of legal migration. Uh, and so I think it's right for the government um, to be thoughtful about who can, who can deal with that policy issue. Sammy. So it's about entitlement and it's about hypocrisy. It's not about somebody who got a speeding fine because I think most people in, 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 in this tolerant country of ours would understand that sometimes drivers exceed the speed limit. It's about someone who's incredibly harsh with other people's infractions um, but incredibly entitled to the point of wanting to be anonymous about her own. Think of a different reality where... Um, the Home Secretary, she, I think she was Attorney General at the time, gets a speeding ticket and, um, and talks to her colleagues about what to do and they say, well, actually, Attorney General, Home Secretary, why don't you either pay the fine or go not just online but go physically to the to the training but center that's, that's not for civil servants to say no no i'm talking about a political a, a political political advice to the home secretary would have been don't be silly mm. humans uh sometimes fail and um don't be haughty don't be arrogant don't say there's one rule for them and one rule for you go and and actually explore this training course and talk about the value of it this is the problem. It's not about speeding in itself. It's not about... I, I read Simon Jenkins and The Guardian and people saying this is all, you know, disproportionate and Labour being ridiculous. It's not about the... how many mu uh, uh, minutes over the limit. It's not about that. It's about one rule for them and another for us. And if the Home Secretary was capable of being like everybody else and not being harsher to them than she is to herself, we'd be, in a, we'd be in a different place. And this is somebody who, like me, is a daughter of migrants to this country mm. who's prepared to say that... And we talk, Daniel talked about illegal migrants. I'm talking about refugees and asylum seekers because you're not illegal until your asylum claim has been determined. This is somebody who wants anybody who makes noise on a protest to be banged up and anybody who comes in a boat to be declared an illegal migrant. Very harsh, very harsh on but, desperate but, people and very arrogant but, about her own entitlement. But on the specifics, I mean, you're, you're a member of the House of Lords, you're a senior figure in public life. If that had been you... Can you honestly say that you wouldn't have even asked if there was any option to do that course? I wouldn't have. Well, well, I was a former civil servant, and so I kind of really care about the civil service um, and the independence of the civil service. So I don't think it's appropriate to ask your civil servants to intervene on your own. And frankly, forget the civil service. If you're running a company, it's not really necessarily ethical to ask the people run, working But you were saying company. it's one rule for her and one rule for others, whereas yes. I suspect a lot of people in public life would have... No, thought to I say, don't... is there any chance I could just do this in private? Yeah, but 
don't ask your civil servants. Mm. So that, that's ask your ask your friends. Ask and you know. But but actually, I think if you're in public life, maybe maybe. So there's the legal ethical thing, and there's also the political mm. thing because ultimately she's a she's a serious politician. She's one of the most senior politicians in our country. And why didn't her political instinct tell her that it's it's a bad idea to be arrogant and entitled in that way? Jane, you want to come in on that? Well, I think. What we need to recognise at the moment is trust in government is at an all-time low. Even our census figures show that. And this comes, the context is really important. You know, we're on our third ethics advisor in three years. We're um, been promised by our Prime Minister a new era of professionalism and integrity and yet we have a Home Office Minister who evidently when she first started asked if the government would pay her speeding fine mm. and now we find is in a place where she's uh, trying to find out because she's so busy um, ways around the system and uh, breaking the ministerial code you can wait for reports but it's very clear you she think asked she has? her oh well it's very clear yes she asked her civil servants They've, they haven't denied that do you think that. Rishi Sunak should just sack well, now. of course he should, but the question is, will he? Because we've entered an era, which I think uh, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson had, when there was no sacking. And that is what has broken so much trust. And I think, you know, there is a saying, once lucky to twice, you know, time's gone. And this is not the first time that Miss Braverman has broken the code. It's not the first time she's mm. shown poor judgment and I think the British public now have had enough and if Mr Sunak doesn't actually act I think it will show he's extremely weak but he's not actually delivering on his promise of uh, uh, integrity and professionalism and it will do nothing to rebuild what I call the social contract with the people in Britain at the moment. David Willits, James's question was about more, but it was broader, it was about Dominic Raab, it was about Nadim Zahawi, it was about Boris Johnson. Have we seen a decline in standards in public life during your party's time in government? I think we have seen more and more scrutiny and I think, look, I started observing politics an awful long time ago. I think some of the things that people got away with in the past, whatever party, they couldn't get away with now. So standards I think, are meant, I think the levels of transparency, the levels of scrutiny, the expectation is higher. And I thought what Shami said about um, people who she thinks the Home Secretary is unforgiving of others, but expecting forgiveness for herself. I think partly also politicians of all parties would say, and I'm no longer active in that kind of politics, that they're operating themselves in a very unforgiving environment where slips that in the past would have been ignored or glossed over or never got into the public eye are increasingly likely to get into the public eye and lead to demands for your resignation or sacking. And taking this case, uh, look, I think we'll, I, if there is an investigation by the ethics advisor, we'll find if she did indeed break the ministerial code, and we've heard several suggestions mm -hmm. of ways in which she may have break the, broken the ministerial code, I don't think it follows from that automatically that should, her resignation should be demanded. My view is that the ministerial code, if you make a, a serious mistake, your career is over and you're out. But, but, I don't but she think, did make a serious yeah, mistake. But, she was well, back in government think, within a week. I think that, that was... A, that was but her career wasn't over. Yeah. She broke the ministerial code for sending confidential documents to someone she shouldn't yes. have been sent to and was brought back into yes, government. But that, that's a, there's a set of questions here about what the gradations of punishment should be in the ministerial code and that being out and back in again oh, is another... David. No, I actually do no, think we've had a there are... There, office there, there should be the ministerial code, which, look, when, again... 40 years ago, it wasn't even a published document. It's now a published document. It's now rightly scrutinised. It shouldn't be the case that every infraction leads to a demand that look, you resign or be we sent. Had a former... That's not a good way, actually, of enforcing them, because it means that guilty means out and end. But what do you career. have to do to get sacked now? So, pretty Patel, well, former, you know, Home Office Minister, seems to be a theme, um, has found to be bullying. Her report was very clear. Boris Johnson did not sack her, even though she had clearly broken the ministerial court, and instead the ethics advisor, Lord Guite, stands down. And I just think that's the wrong Alex, way round. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, uh, well, gosh, it's been in, a, in, a, in addition to that, I, 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 you know, I think David was very kind to refer to what I said about it. it's the two-way street, isn't mm. it? It's not just... 
that you you know that to, to err is human it's just that these are humans who are really really tough on anybody that it suits them to be tough for political reasons you do this you do this populist culture war stuff for protesters refugees whatever and then you talk to your civil servants about not wanting to take the speeding fund it's the t it's the lack of the two way street it's the hypocrisy that gets you in the end i mean the thing that strikes me just listening to this conversation and thinking a bit about the work that i do every day running businesses the the the, the steps you have to take um, when there is an allegation of anything in a business are lengthy, serious, you know, you don't rush to judgment, uh, you give people the opportunity to explain themselves, um, have representation, and, and the contrast between that very reasonable, sensible way of working um, stands uh, starkly mm -hmm. compared to what we expect of politicians, where we always say, the, the smallest infraction, out you go. And I, I just think that it's le leading to a coarseness of politics mm -hmm. and something but that Daniel, is just, it's very different than what's happening in the real What about people sector? accused of benefit fraud? What about people accused of being illegal migrants what about people accused of making serious disruption on a protest it's not it's not just politicians who are getting a hard scrutiny here it's some people who are a lot less fortunate than than politicians and it's not just one off is it i think that's the problem there's been repeated problems with miss braverman and i think that's that's also part of the context she broke the ministerial code by her own admission um you know a few months ago now she's been reinstated it's these lapses of judgment which which i think is the issue here I david, think... david sorry just on that you, you say there are gradations, of course, of mm, the mystery. Yeah. If someone's found to have done it twice in the space of the year, can they feasibly continue in government, whatever those offences may be? Uh, I think it does depend on what the offences were. I mean, the, the, the it is. I don't think all offences in the ministerial code are sackable offences. But even if you do it twice in a year, and I, and it, well, it depends what the what they are and exactly what is found. If there's an investigation in this case, but I don't think it's automatic. And I think this this sense they immediately have to resign is. Act, I don't think even is good for enforcing the ministerial code. It makes it a much cruder document than it is supposed to be. Do you think? I would, I would, by the way, I would agree with that, David. Me However. Too. This is not a court of law. This is politics, yep. and she's one of the most senior yep. members of the of the cabinet. So it's not, you know, I'm not sitting here as a magistrate saying, oh, she's got to, okay. go. you know, she's she's failed politically. Forget that. Forget the law. James, in a sentence, if you would, wonder what you've made of uh, the other response to your question, James and Chelsea. Yeah, um, and yeah, I so thought it's been, you know, what I mean, quite in, quite enthralling actually. But yeah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, as, as people have said, you know what I mean. She has got one of the well, she's got one of the highest jobs in in the land. You know. And Do you, you think this to, matters, to, James? Does this this story matter to you? Well, yeah, it does because it's about honesty, it's about integrity, okay. it's about what it's about what's being done in front of me, but not knowing what's going on. You know what I mean? When you know what I mean, everything's gone away. Gotcha. It's all like sort of jazz hands. Everything's great, but it's what's the lack of transparency. Got you. Yeah. James, thank you for your question. That was James and Churchill. Lots more to come. Going to hear from Kevin in Oxford in just a moment. You know the number to get your question in 0345 6060 973. 818 the time. This is LBC.
Ask Question on LBC. Call 0345 6060 8.20 is the time. Thank you to share with you on LBC. In the studio with me for Cross Question, Baroness Sharmi Chakrabarti, the Labour peer and former Shadow Attorney General. Uh, Lord David Willits, Conservative peer, former Universities Minister. Jane Ozan is with us, former Government Advisor on LGBT issues and Chair of the Banned Conversion Therapy Coalition. And Daniel Korski is here, former Deputy Head of Policy for David Cameron and now a candidate for the Conservatives for Mayor of London. 0345 6060 973, the number to call if you want to ask a, our panel a question. Uh, someone who's done exactly that is Kevin in Oxford. Kevin, good evening. What's your question, sir? Yes, good evening. Yes, I'd like to ask your panel, um, with the uh, approximations of uh, asylum seekers and migrants, be it legal or illegal, possibly being a million in the next year, I'd like to ask your panel individually, and I'm going to give them some options, where they're going to house these people, be it social housing, private landlords, hotels, barges or ex-ministry defence barracks. And I'd like a straight answer, not skirting around the houses, excuse the bunk. Kevin, I think you're getting the, the concern about the increase in net migration, most of it legal, of course, but placing on public services and infrastructure. Uh, Jane Ozan. Well, let's be honest that some of that migration from has been from Ukraine, uh, and we've put them up ourselves. And I think that that shows that there's a British desire to help people. And I think we've never actually asked the British population whether they would help house other uh, asylum seekers. And that's, you know, that's just not been on the cards. And I think that is an, an option. I think the real issue is the amount of money we're spending uh, housing people day in, day out could actually be used to um, invest in the staff to process those applications to ensure that we're cutting back on that number and that we're not putting people through misery. I mean, ultimately, putting people on barges or in, you know, really, I think, quite horrific accommodation when they've been through war zones, when they've nearly drowned in the channel, I think is, is, is elite, immoral myself. So I, I do hope we're treating them with some dignity. I hope we're looking after the children well. I do think we need to ask the British public. And I hope that more importantly, we will focus on cutting that backlog. Uh, David Willits, the government's reported to be looking at ways to cut legal migration, clamping down on uh, relatives of students coming here to study, for example. Is that the right approach? Should we be reducing the numbers that seem to be going up and up at the moment in terms of legal migration? Well, I mean, it, a lot depends on the circumstance to which they come, which is also the, the answer to Kevin's question. Uh, if you're a Ukrainian refugee, as we've heard, British families have done a fantastic job. If you're a Hong Kong refugee, you're very likely to be here and working. If you've come here as a student, you'll have been expected to show that you have the means of maintaining yourself and family members, if you're bringing them, by actually producing bank accounts with money in them as evidence before you receive a visa to come to the country. So you're then expected to pay for your accommodation. So those are the type of ways this happens. Now, when it comes to students, and I was formerly the universities minister, I was very, has been very close to this issue. Uh, my view is that the crucial thing is we expect them to return home at the end of their course of studies or at the end of their course of studies and then having uh, worked here if they're allowed to for a period of, say, two years. There isn't an automatic right to stay here permanently. Mm. The only reason we're calling people like that immigrants is because there's a United Nations definition which says you're, if you're in the country for more than a year, that means that you are defined as an immigrant. There are other countries that, of course, we all have to, we're all aware of the UN statistics, but there are other countries that don't take the UN statistic as the basis for their policy. So is this, so is reducing the number of students and all their, their relatives they come, is that a way of really just massaging the figures? Well, if they are genuinely coming here to study, they've passed the financial criteria for coming, and they're going to go back to their country they came from at the end of their study taking any dependents they brought yes. over with them then i don't see what the problem is with that and indeed i would say to some people who do think it's a problem it does seem to me rather ironic given that we um uh, as a conservative party believe in britain governing ourselves and making our own policy choices why the united nations should determine our policy on so this. you'd like them to remove it, students from my, those my view figures. is we should learn from competitor countries that also attract lots of overseas students like Australia, 
who make it clear that if you are coming as a student, that is a different from coming as a migrant to come and live permanently in the country and treat them as separate sorts of cases. Now, if there is abuse, if there are people who are coming over saying they're coming to study, but are then staying longer term, or we're losing track of their relatives or whatever, then Mm -hmm. you have to be tough. But provided you can require them to leave afterwards, I don't see what the problem is. So focusing on students, just just briefly on this, in terms of when it comes to reducing net migration figures, do you think it's the wrong approach? I think we should need to be uh, tough on the figures, but I don't think that reducing overseas students who are legitimately here and who will return home afterwards is a way of tackling the problem, because it is not a problem. It's actually a very successful successful British export, bringing revenues into the country, boosting the prosperity of towns that have got universities in them. Daniel Korski, London highly dependent in many ways, the economy on migration more than other parts of the country, also at the same time has a massive housing crisis. Where are you on this one? Well, look, I'm an immigrant and I came to this city uh, in 97 and I've made a success of myself and this city has shown over centuries that it is not only incredibly capable of absorbing people and putting them to good work, but also the sort of place where um, their dreams can come true. Um, So this city, London, isn't the sort of place um, that ought to be, you know, closing the doors to to migrants. Quite the opposite. You know, we need people to come to the city to make a success of themselves. But it's critically important that they are, you know, able to find the sort of housing and schooling and so on. And that happens when government plans smartly. David talked about the Hong Kongers, uh, the B&O passport holders who've come here. Um, it's hard to know exactly what the figures are, but um, but probably around 180,000 people have applied for the pass um, to come here. How many have come, we don't quite know, but let's assume that at least about 40 or 50,000 have come to London. Have you heard a peep? Has there been any complaints? No, because one, people were very um, open-minded about the immigration. Two, people who've come here have been coming here with the intention of of working hard and establishing themselves successfully. And but, three, but, but, and three, government prepared. And that's really important. Government but, prepared schools, hospitals. Um, didn't prepare homes, though, did they? The number of new homes is going through the floor. And that, that's Kevin's point, is even if they're working, even if they're supporting themselves, they are still taking up a house in a but, time of housing shortage. That, that's Kevin's concern. And the answer to which is build, 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 build especially yeah. in the city. We need to build more homes, we need to build more houses, we need to do it over railway tracks, we need to densify the centre of London. There are lots of things we need to do, but build, build, build homes is absolutely critical also to answer this question. Shami, has it been a, Shami Chakrabarty, has it been a, a failure of governments of, of Tory and Labour persuasions to fail to keep house building rates in line with the uh, increase in net migration? Have we, have we failed when it comes to housing over the last 20 years? Yes, and it's partly about building, it's partly about rent controls, and it's partly about allowing super wealthy people, including Russian oligarchs, to own massive blocks mm. that, that, that sit along the River Thames that are empty um, because a lot of people have been buying building stock as assets like gold bullion and, and it's and actually shelter is a human right and so we're suffering and nurses and police officers and so on can't live close to where they work in the city. On the immigration question, I pretty much agree with everything that's been said on this panel so far by David and Jane and Daniel. I would just add this. You know, my parents were migrants to this country, legal migrants to this country, but my priority is refugees mm. for a much smaller number, much, much smaller number than, than, than legal, so-called legal migration. A country is allowed to decide what its economy needs in terms of migration. And it can um, and and and, if, and it can boost salaries in in the care sector or other sectors, so to have fewer people come in, or it can encourage more people to come in. But the refugee convention, um, drafted after the Holocaust, is non-negotiable, mm. and the numbers coming in the small boats are tiny compared to those who are coming in as so-called legal migrants and for me that kind of humanitarian protection is non-negotiable and don't tell me that ukrainians are all right and hong kong is a, a bit all right and afghans was, was are that less what you were sort right. of saying was that what daniel was saying or? no i'm just simply saying that um that there are examples and the ukrainians and the hong kongers are two great examples where there's been a enormous um 
you know, welcoming mm. on behalf of Britons. Rightly B, there's so. Been, yeah, and B, there's been preparation by the government to manage the inflow. And we could do that for others, and we could well, do that for others. That's the point. That I'm, I'm sort point. of agreeing with Daniel, actually, yeah. that we could do that for others too, because genuine refugees are a much smaller number. And I agree with David, you can decide... Um, how many people you want to come for your economic purposes and you can make sure that those who come on a temporary basis as students or tourists or whatever it is come and go. Just but refugee brief. protection is non-negotiable. Which was exactly my point about asking the British public to look after refugees. But if I can be honest, Kevin, I heard your question, but I also heard the tone of it, which seemed to have quite a lot of anger about what are we going to do with all these people? Let's be clear, we need migration. We need an economy that is going to be focused on growth. We need people who are going to come in and work in our social care sector, we're going, who are going to pick crops, who are going to do a lot of the jobs that we can't find But we also need more for. hopes. We do. Because there is a we do. We do. And we need to, and we are being honest about that, and that is about planning, which is exactly Daniel's point. Mm. We need to have the public sectors that can serve us. But if we want to have a growth economy, we have to prioritise this, and that is not being done by government at the moment. Kevin, very briefly, just been accused of sounding a bit angry. Are you reassured by what you've heard by the panel? Not one of your panel answer my questions. £2,300 is an average uh, rental in London now. I've got daughters living with me, so they can't afford, um, they're in their 20s, can't afford to rent. Um, I think mm. that a lot of the public are getting angry. Um, 2300 a month for property, who's going to afford that? Rent control. We need rent control. Well, so people should not empty. be able to profit in this yeah. way out of other people's homelessness and need for shelter. Rent control End has of. worked almost nowhere where it's been tried. And the problem with rent control is that it locks in the people who happen to be in the houses at that very okay. moment. I think the answer, Kevin, was really everyone agreed when we need to build more homes. Certainly mm -hmm. very few people yes. would disagree with that. I've been banging on about it <laughs> for months and months mm. there on LBC. Thank you for your question. That was Kevin in Oxford. Go to speak to Ben in Clacton in just a moment to hear what the panel think, or find out what the panel think, about Keir Starmer and his plan, or was there one, to fix the NHS. That's next. 8.31 is the time. Let's get some news headlines first from Tim Daly. Junior doctors in England have announced another strike as part of their pay dispute with the government. The British Medical Association says there will be a 72-hour walkout from the 14th of June. The government says the decision is surprising and deeply disappointing. The Home Secretary is insisting she did not try to evade sanction over a speeding ticket last year. The Cabinet Minister told MPs earlier on she's focusing on delivering for the British people. And the Shadow Health Secretary has told LBC if Labour fails to to deliver on its promises for the NHS in England, he would not expect to keep doing the job. West Streeting has been speaking after Sir Keir Starmer outlined the party's commitments on health. LBC weather dry tonight with largely clear spells for England and Wales, but cloudier in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Lows of four degrees. This is LBC.
Cross Question on LBC. Text 84850. 8.35 the time. You listen to Cross Question here on LBC. I'm Ben Kedges. With me in the studio uh, on our panel tonight, Lord David Willits, Conservative peer, former Universities Minister, Jane Ozan, a former government advisor on LGBT issues, Daniel Korski, former head of policy, deputy head of policy for David Cameron, now a Conservative candidate for Mayor of London, and Baroness Shami Chakrabarti, Labour peer, former Shadow Attorney General. Get back to your questions for the panel. 03456060973, the number if you have got one. Uh, ben is next in Clacton. Ben, good evening. Hello, Ben. Anneli. Good evening, panel. My question is, do the panel think that Keir Starmer's plans to use private health care to reduce waiting lists are a good idea? For Ben, thank you. It's a, a policy that both the Tories and Labour have been putting forward as a, a, a proposal to drive down that NHS backlog of 7.3 million, I think it is now. Uh, Lord Willits, is the uh, more use of the private sector part of the solution to the NHS crisis? I think it is part of the solution. I think we have a, we have a capacity problem. We can't get as much health output as we need solely from the NHS. So if this is a way in which you can genuinely treat more people... Uh, of course, without their having to pay up front. But if the if we can buy that capacity from the private sector so that more people get treatment than would otherwise have happened, I think that would be very good. I must say, I wasn't aware that Keir Starmer had proposed that in what no, was a more no. general speech. No. I think it's possibly this is something that may have come uh, from uh, my party, the Conservative Party. But if Keir Starmer also signed up for it, that would be fantastic. Uh, he's also, he has spoken in the past about being very open to using the uh, private mm. sector to reduce waiting times. Shami Chakrabarti, is that something that you're pleased, your party leader? is talking about? Again, my understanding was that we're open to private tech innovation um, in, in relation to dealing with waiting lists and, and, and access and organisation and administration. I think it's really important that we do have that more centralised procurement um, to, to make the most of the massive negotiating power of an, an NHS. In terms of healthcare provision, um, I do believe in the NHS uh, vision, which is my patriotism. It's even got the word national in it. You know, if you want to do if you want to do nationalism and patriotism in this country, stay away from the khaki and the red, white, and blue, and stick to the blue and white NHS. That would be my slogan for the next general election or, or, or any mayoralty <laughs> election that anybody wants. So, I thought that we were talking today much more about being more tech savvy, being more tech literate, being better at our tech procurement, and making sure that we sort out appointments, waiting lists, administration. As for the basic principles of the NHS, I think that they've yet to be bettered in the world. The basic principle of of that kind of primary care, free at the point of use, I think is probably the greatest pro progressive but, but, political project But if it's free at the point of use, history. but you're treated by a private doctor in a private hospital and the NHS pays for it, is that a problem? No, it, it's not a problem. It's, it, it, it's a great thing. So it's something you would support? Like if Labour was no, 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 no. using if, if, private hospitals I think, as, as a no, way to... Try I mean, I think that more private pro hospitals should have been requisitioned during the pandemic, mm. by the way, because, you know, ordinary people made enormous sacrifices and the sacrifices were more not met by people with hotels and stately homes and private hospitals who should have been requisitioned to the to the national quasi wartime effort. What I don't want is for profit to cream off the ability to to meet the need that that you know. But it's, it's not an ideological problem about the private sector versus the, mm. the public sector. It's an ideological commitment to keeping costs down and investing as much as possible in the best health care for everyone, regardless of their means. Okay. Daniel. Um, technology has the extraordinary ability to transform our healthcare provision, right? Helping people um, prevent themselves from the various uh, diseases and ailments, ensuring that treatment can be enabled by artificial intelligence, helping people recover much more uh, expeditiously. Unfortunately, the NHS is digitally Luddite. Uh, 
It's incredibly difficult to sell great technology into the NHS to ensure that there's take up and if it works in one hospital, scaling it to all others so that there isn't a differentiation of experience. It's incredibly difficult to do that. And if Keir Starmer is proposing to do that uh, in an easier way, I'd welcome it. Um, what I would additionally want to explore is um, why can't we devolve more control over healthcare to regional areas? You know, healthcare has been devolved to Manchester. Um, there's been a deal to devolve health care to Birmingham. Uh, it stands to reason that London should be part of that conversation too. So to me, um, technology has the potential to transform healthcare, but the NHS currently isn't particularly good at it. And there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, uh, you don't have to have any kind of sort of training in what good technology is or what bad technology is in order to progress uh, in the NHS. But this is complex. You need people to understand what technology can do and what it can't do. So first of all, we've got to prioritize making people more digitally literate inside the NHS. The second point is, we're not very good at integrating these different systems. The NHS has developed into this sprawling system with lots of different organizations and lots of different IT solutions. If you don't integrate all those, it gets very difficult to provide patients with a seamless experience. If you, God forbid, have a heart attack right now and you're picked up by an ambulance, they will not be able to look up your patient record. Yeah. Now that's absurd because something could happen to you. They might not want to give you a certain kind of blood thinning medicine. They need to know that. That is possible in Estonia. That is possible in Denmark. That ought to be possible here. So any politician at national level who wants to push this, um, all power to their elbow. What I would like to see is chopping uh, the NHS into smaller digitally manageable chunks so that in Manchester, the West Midlands, and also London, we can provide the sort of digitally enabled solutions that, mm. that work. Mm. Well, I'm not sure about the that. The danger of that yes. is that they won't have the, they won't have the procurement power yes, exactly. that they have as an NHS. Right. And they have I mean, massive procurement the power. NHS. <laughs> yeah. So I managed uh, the charitable hospitals of a very large um, NHS uh, uh, in, in, in my region, and I sat on the board. And... You know, we have a crisis in in healthcare, and I think one of the things I do agree with Kit Starmer with today, it is broken. You know, we've had years of underfunding. We've yeah. got massive capital needs. You know, many theatres need rebuilding. We've got huge things that have been put on hold. We've got a morale issue. We've got pay issues. We've got a system in crisis. And the people who are paying most are actually the public, whose lives are, are often being damaged because they're not getting the... Um, the healthcare that they need, they're not getting the diagnosis or the treatment. So to answer your caller, should we be using the private health? Yes, we're in a crisis. We need to use every um, element we can. However, I believe that the answers are in the health centre. We've got experts who've been living and giving their lives to that. We just need to listen to them mm. and empower them and, you know, and, and honour them. There is some change that's needed, but my goodness, we've got more change consultants in the hospital <laughs> I used to work in than we have sometimes I feel, mm. you know, actual medical consultants. And what we need is to empower people, pay them properly, give them the operating theatres and the capital that they need. But most of all, we need to recognise we're in crisis, and that is what Keir Starmer did today. But if I'm not willing to... Yeah, just if, on this empowering people, it does look as if Labour are going to reopen one of the great debates when the NHS was founded, which is the status of GPs. So GPs are at the moment independent contractors. Mm. And that does give them a degree of power over how they run their own surgeries. My understanding is Labour is saying they should become salaried employees of the NHS, which was the argument that that was for and won by people who didn't want that to happen when the NHS was set up. And look, if they go down that route, we're going to spend years arguing about the status of GPs rather than getting on. We're just giving the NHS some stability and letting it catch up with the terrible waiting lists we've now got. Just briefly on, on Jane's point about the NHS being broken, do you accept that the health service is broken? Because some people might say that with respect, you were part of the governments that broke it. I don't think the NHS is broken. I think it's under massive pressure and it's clearly got a terrible backlog, um, partly from COVID, partly from other reasons. But I don't think it's fundamentally broken. And here, actually, I do think there is a cross-party uh, agreement. A publicly financed healthcare system using the nation state as the biggest pool that we've got to share risk so no nobody has to pay for their healthcare up front. I think that is a settled part of how 
Britain mm. runs our affairs, and I don't think either, and the, the Conservative Party doesn't wish to change that, and nor do the other parties. David, we've got nurses on strike, we've got junior doctors on strike, we've got ambulance mm. workers on strike, we've got people who, I think the NHS has got long COVID itself. People are exhausted mm. after um, just being clapped. For let's, <laughs> let's come on to that, Jane, right now, because Leanne in Chorleywood very helpfully has texted asking, are junior doctors right to say a 5% pay rise offer is paltry? The BMA then to Night announcing a 72-hour strike uh, next month. Going to ask you to answer this one in a sentence, if I may. Uh, Daniel. I think that they've been given a decent offer. Um, there's no doubt the junior doctors have a pretty, uh, you know, difficult time in the NHS, and I think it's worth looking at a whole range of their conditions for, 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 for their work, uh, their training, their hours, but I think uh, the salary offer that they've been receiving seems reasonable. Uh, Jason. Jane. I... I think they have a case to ask for more. I think they have been cut back, but I think their actual ask is un unrealistic and, frankly, I think one of the words um, that others have used of it is silly. So I, I don't think 5% is enough, given how much has been paid. back. Is it paltry? Paltry. It depends on what you define by paltry. I, I, I think that the nurses have been given a paltry... Um, Okay, and I, my focus would be on ensuring the nursing staff are prioritised because I think their job prospects aren't quite the same as junior okay. doctors. But I do think that they uh, they have a case, but I don't think they're making it as well as the nurses are. Uh, David Willis. I, I think it's tough. I don't think it's paltry. And my understanding is there's also a special one-off payment to help with their costs mm, over yes. the past year. So it is a, it's not simply 5% on its own. Mm. Uh, it's, it's almost an insult to call them junior doctors when you think about what they actually do 24-7, the reality of what a so-called junior doctor is doing to save lives and keep that system functioning. Is 5% paltry? I, I, I won't. Um, I won't be the the definition of poultry. Is it enough? Um, no, not for. But, not but for your me. party uh, won't uh, commit to going further. Well, I, you know, I'm not. I'm not in charge. But what I would say is, we need solidarity across the health sector, mm. the doctors, the nurses, the patients. We all clapped, and now it's now it's time that the government actually um, stumps up. Is it time for your party leader to say he'd stump up if you think it's not enough? Presumably, you want your party leadership to go further. Well, you than know, I'm not. A, I've never been elected, not to a parish council or a PTA committee. So You've it's not got a for view. me. So I do think that um, there is a balance to be struck between being cautious and being and showing that you're a better manager, which is important given the, the the mismanagement of the country and the vision thing. And I think we need a bit of a 1945 moment, mm. having been through this terrible pandemic and some terrible mismanagement. We need the vision thing as well as the management thing. Keir Starmer needs to be a bit more clement Atley. A little bit. A little bit of clem. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, lots more to come in just a moment. We're going to talk uh, to Brian in Wolverhampton in just a moment. and get uh, Well, we're going to get his question about same-sex marriage. That to come. This is LBC. I'm Ben Kentish, 8.47. LBC.
Cross Question on LBC. 8.50, Ben Kedges here with you uh, for Cross Question on LBC in for Ian Dale tonight. Joining the studio by Baroness uh, Shami Chakrabarti, Labour peer, Daniel Korski, a Tory uh, candidate, Conservative candidate for Mayor of London, Lord David Willett, a Conservative peer, and Jane Ozan, a former government advisor on LGBT issues. And that is the subject of our next question, a text question from Brian in Wolverhampton, who asks, should Parliament intervene? to force the Church of England to accept same-sex marriage. The Church obviously not there yet by its own accord. Uh, should Parliament force it to accept same-sex marriage? Jane, you're very involved in this campaign. You were just saying you lead on this within the Church, uh, calling for this exactly. Should Parliament intervene to force the Church of England to do this? Well, I think Parliament um, knows that there is a complete mismatch now between the laws of the land and the laws of the church, and that the established church does not serve the whole of the British populace. I, and, and actually a very large proportion of the Church of England would like to be able to marry uh, people like myself in their churches, but can't because there's another portion of the church that is blocking that. And therefore, there is no equality. There, there is sadly a lot of harm that's done, a lot of people being told that their uh, love is second rate and second... Um, well, and and in, in many churches being told that they are sinful, sadly. And I think that Parliament has a duty to both use carrots and sticks to try and get the church to a place which will be out of this stalemate and into a place where it can honour all of us. So we have looked at ways, I work with parliamentarians, uh, carrots, how mm. do we encourage the church to move forward? And we've done that by saying we'd like to remove all the barriers that would stop the church from moving forward. But now we're also looking at sticks. Are there things that the uh, parliament can do to bring in same-sex marriage itself? And yes, that brings up some big issues. But if ultimately the church has been stuck and it's been stuck on these issues for decades now, meanwhile, young LGBT people growing up in those churches are suffering huge mental health issues, mm -hmm. are often, sadly, you know, even getting to a point where they're looking at taking their lives because they cannot cope with a message that who, who they love is unacceptable and sinful. How much longer do we give it? Parliament says it. You've had long enough to do this voluntarily. We're going to make you. We're talking months? Are we talking years? Well, uh, nothing moves <laughs> fast, either in church or state. But I think the British public is sick, frankly, uh, of a church that it, they perceive as hypocritical in preaching about the love of God and then um, putting caveats on that love. And I do think that if the Church of England cannot find a way through, and we were, we, I don't want to bore people with Church of England politics, but we were supposed to uh, have some debates in the summer that would have moved this on. That's all now been, so oh, that's a bit close. We might need to do it in November. It constantly gets delayed. Mm. And I think unless Parliament is prepared to intervene and threaten things like disestablishment or looking at even coming up with a way of enabling same-sex marriage, we won't see any change. Uh, Shami Chakrabarti, has the time already come for Parliament to say is enough is enough, this needs to happen now? So as a matter of human rights principle, I, I believe that equal treatment of, of humans, equal treatment in people's dignity goes to the heart of the human rights framework. But equally, there is religious freedom. Yeah. And that is a very, very important mm. religious principle. It's not principle. an absolute right, is it? Is it, is it, is it um, it's up to the point that it causes harm. I'm going to be sort of in agreement with you if you if you let me Sorry. develop this a moment. <laughs> at a moment. So it's a matter of human rights principle. We have equal treatment, but we also have religious freedom, and that means um, and re and freedom of conscience and freedom of that means the right to be wrong as well. So as a matter of principle around the world, I would not force any church or any religion around the world to um, accept women clerics to accept that a woman of a different race or whatever should even be acceptable in their faith community. But where Jane is astute is that in this country we have an established church and that is her leverage and that is why she quite understandably wields the stick of disestablishment. That is the special relationship that this parliament mm. has with this church. Because with other religions, we can say, within as long as you're not hurting other people, you are entitled to exclude people from your own faith community. That is freedom of conscience and religion and freedom of speech. But 
but the complication for the Church of England is the relationship, the, the tethered relationship between church and state. And that is why um, Jane is astute to say, if you want to be part of this mm. state settlement, there comes a point when you need to catch up with societal values, not just for the good of your faith community, but if you want to be an so established just brief, church. So just if a bill came before the House of Lords to force the Church of England to do this, you'd support it? Well, not necessarily, because I, 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 I wouldn't force any religion to accept people that it didn't want to accept. But if if in time there was an argument about disestablishment based on non-compliance with human rights norms, then we're in mm. a much more delicate conversation. Lord Willis, how, how about you? Is that something you would, you would support? I think it is tricky because of this issue of religious freedom that Shem has talked about. And of course, um, it would be very odd. We'd be saying, doesn't the Catholic Church, the other religious faiths can do what they wish? We have no desire to force same-sex marriage on them, though, of course, it would be desirable if they did accept it. And look, I was in David Cameron's cabinet when he fought the battle, at the time very controversial, to establish that in Britain as a civil state, legally, same-sex marriage is absolutely possible. I think saying because it's established we're going to have a special rule for the Church of England still intrudes on Shambi's principle. It is requiring a set of people who may wrongly or not have a set of beliefs about marriage to comply with legislation. They may choose to disestablish, of course. Yeah, but it's much more complicated. Over half the Church of England want to have same-sex ah. marriage, and well, so they, and, and, which and case they ought to be able to sort that out. Yeah, well, exactly, and it's the part, it's the part that doesn't want it who are blocking progress. And what we want is freedom of conscience. So I don't want to be married by a priest who doesn't want to marry me. That would be ridiculous. Mm. But I do want to be able to be married in a church that wants to marry and celebrate okay. and bless me. Daniel, in a line, if you would, because I want to ask you about traffic lights as well. Uh, I'm hugely proud also to have been part of a government that legalised same-sex marriage. It's something that I look back at with great pride. Um, I think it's right to put pressure on the church. Uh, I think it's right to use all the levers uh, available to you, including through contacts with Parliament. I think it is not quite right for the state to interfere that aggressively okay. in the in the in the church affairs. Okay, Brian in Wolverhampton, thank you for that question. Uh, Peter in Clapham asks: I read that Daniel Korski wants to turn off traffic lights in London overnight. A. What? A. Daniel. <laughs> well, that's not quite right. The argument that I've been making is that today we can use sensors and other sort of technology to detect where, where cars are. And instead of having people stand in front of red lights at four in the morning when the streets are deserted with their engines on waiting for the light to change, what I'm arguing for is technology to detect those cars and then be able to switch the light. Lots of other countries do exactly that. And indeed, the Department for Transport is uh, spending money on trying to explore how to do so elsewhere. Swear. Uh, this shouldn't really be Ooh. controversial. We don't want people to stand idly uh, when there's no it traffic. It sounds controversial, controversial today. Because, well, absolutely. I'd rather that money go into the NHS. Okay, this is a question of priority. But I'm not arguing the money... for the money. The money is already being spent by the DFT. What well, I'm arguing for is... Well, I'm arguing for the money. What I'm I, arguing I for is... You know, I think it's a question of priorities, as always. And do I want money on technology that stops me waiting a minute at traffic lights or money that could go into something that's actually improving someone's life? Can I explain why I think Brief, the Very, same. very briefly. This please. is about air quality. This is about not having your engine running when you don't have to so that it doesn't have a health impact that one costs us more. For one okay, minute. David Willits, good idea? Um, I, I actually like Dan's <laughs> excitement about technology. I think the more we can bring technology and innovation into delivery of public services, the better. So if that's what he thinks could work, I'm up for it. Uh, Banish, check for Barty. I don't drive, but send me on a course and I won't, um, I won't ask to turn my camera off. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> we like that. Our final fun question of the night comes from Janet in St Helens, who asked the panel this. A former clown is going to play Matt Hancock in a stage show about his leaked WhatsApp messages. What's the ideal full a job for someone to have before they're asked to play you on stage or screen? Good question, Janet. Shall we check with Barty and put you on the spot? <laughs> and the ideal um, occupation for someone to play me on stage or screen would be an actor. Preferably very tall and beautiful. <laughs> an actor? <laughs> Actress. To play me, yeah. Oh, we, we say you, actor. You we want... say actor now in general, in gender neutral terms, David. You want you want someone me. to be able to properly nail your everything about you. The Stanislavski method. They have to feel my pain. <laughs> they have to feel my pain. Okay. Yeah, I, I see that, uh, Jane. 
God, well, the answer that came to mind was a, a nun. <laughs> Why a nun? A nun, I know. Well, because so much of my life was spent believing uh, very passionately that my faith told me that I couldn't be gay and that I tried to change. I put myself through conversion practices and it ended me in hospital a couple of times. But my faith was so key to me and therefore I was uh, unable to love and be loved. So there we go. I'm, I'm pleased to say that I'm no longer a nun and I'm very much single. And if there's a wonderful woman out there, I'm um, <laughs> looking for someone you to play. You've, you've let our, you put our <laughs> listeners on notice. That's a value to radio, isn't it? There we go. There's a story to follow here. Uh, Daniel Corsky. Gosh, um, I guess it would have to be a juggler because I feel that uh -huh. all I'm doing oh. is juggling job, uh, family, uh, mission. Bit cheesy, very, but very good. good. We like that. We like that, Daniel. And Nord Willits, David Willits. Well, something about my life that I'm really proud of and gives me a lot of satisfaction is swimming. So I think a swimmer, a bit in the spirit of, you know, someone who's really. Hunky and muscular <laughs> and athletic. Who springs to mind? Oh, I don't know. Be Matt Damon. <laughs> That'd be a great. That's a great offer. I'll take that. Take that, Janet. Thank you for your question. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you very much to our panel: to Baroness Shami Chakrabarti, Daniel Korski, Lord David Willis, and Jane Ozan for your time and your company this evening. Coming up after news, we're going to be talking about race as the uh, Real Madrid player Vinicius Junior. Uh, as the subject of a row over race following horrific racial abuse at a match with Valencia and a commentator a commentator on the TV coverage appears to suggest that he almost brought it on himself by being provocative have you ever been blamed for the racism and the discrimination that you faced if you tried to speak out about it if you tried to explain what was going on have you experienced a case where you were told that it was effectively a result of your own behaviour, that it was you that was responsible, that it wasn't the racists or the people uh, guilty of that discrimination or prejudice, but you that was at fault? 0345 6060 973. That next. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, the government says the decision of junior doctors in England to strike again over pay is surprising and deeply disappointing. It's been responding after the British Medical Association announced its members will stage a third walkout lasting for 72 hours from the 14th of June. The union says it's responding to a 5% pay rise, saying the offer is paltry. Daniel Korski is running to be the Conservatives' candidate for Mayor of London and has been talking to LBC. I think that they've been given given a decent offer. Um, there's no doubt the junior doctors